This presentation is about 30 pieces that Bach composed and compiled in the 1720s under the titles Invention and Symphonia. He titled this collection, Upright Instruction, wherein lovers of the clavier, and especially those desirous of learning, are shown a clear way not only first to learn to play clearly in two voices, because that's hard enough, but also after further progress, too, to deal correctly and well with three obligato parts at the same time, not only to have good inventions, the Latin word, but to develop the same well, and above all, to arrive at a singing manner in playing, and at the same time to acquire a strong foretaste in composition. Now, the first version of these 30 pieces appeared in the little notebook for Wilhelm Friedemann Bach, between 1720 and 23, under the titles of Preambula and Fantasias, respectively. And their initial titles reveal the piece's original purpose, that of demonstrating improvisation through figuration, and of polyphonic writing for keyboard, respectively. These were um, common functions of pieces with these titles uh, leading up to this point. The new titles, however, refer to the revised collection's didactic approach to composition and style, in addition to keyboard playing as a whole, as is evidenced by this preface. The Inventions and Symphonias join Book One of the Well-Tempered Clavier and the Wilhelm Friedemann Notebook in revealing Bach's desire to equip his students with not only comprehensive fluency at the keyboard, but also in high Baroque stylistic devices. All three collections, in addition to the Orga Buchlein, carry a pedagogical preface, but only the inventions and symphonias speak of compositional craftsmanship as a goal for the learner, specifically through the term invention. The pedagogical purpose of this collection included knowledge not only of counterpoint and harmony, but also the creation of compositions through a common practice vocabulary of musical rhetoric that is, figuration through musical gestures. Little groupings of notes essentially mean something. They may not mean a literary reference or a scripture reference, as would have been the case in a lot of Lutheran Germany, but they would mean perhaps how you approach them at the keyboard, how you convey what they are telling you. And the what is what we are going to get into. <clears throat> Through these pieces, through, have through these pieces, apostrophe, um, rhetorical content, you can find out how to arrive at this cantabile style and how to get a foretaste in composition. Please bear with me for a bit because we're going to get into some didactic stuff of names and dates and places. Beginning with the late 16th century. The disciplines of rhetoric and music in German education occupied a central place in the liberal arts, in part due to the influence of Lutheran theology. Music supplemented the preaching of the church, thus elevating it to a sermon through sound, and its delivery required the highest standard of training. Luther actually wrote about this extensively. Additionally, musical education was influenced by a mathematical understanding of music and a greater interest in the affective emotional states of rhetoric. Both aspects of Germany ultimately fed into not only the education of musicians, but also the act of composition, particularly for musical texts. The drawing together of the roles of composer and performer in text delivery reflected Italian stylistic developments in the early 1600s and was adopted by the German theorist Joachim Burmeister nearly simultaneously in his Musica Poetica. Things crossed over the Alps and they started taking root. Over the course of the 17th century, compositional trends began to include a rich vocabulary of musical rhetorical figures designed to convey affect by virtue of their notated content without text. 
treatises by Michael Pretorius in the 1610s and Daniel Merck and Daniel Speer in the 1690s, all addressing instrumental music, revealed the growing prominence in both purely instrumental music and its education throughout the 17th century. Related to this was the practice of lochi topichi, or subject areas, designed to give an orator, and in music the composer, specific themes and to unify materials and delivery. Historical keyboardist Joel Spierstra reasons that a family of shapes might yield a variety of expressions, in essence codifying a visual notation that expresses the rhetorical affect of every gesture on the printed page. Now we're getting specific. Such was the design of Musica Poetica. By the early 18th century, musical figurations themselves achieved a common practice akin to vocabulary, typically found in ornamenting melody. Johann Nicolaus Forkel in 1788 summarized these as figures of understanding and figures of feeling. It's also probably no coincidence that he was Bach's first biographer. The writings of Athanasius Kircher, Johann Matheson, and Forkel contain lists of descriptive adjectives accompanied by figures to be included in composition. Other treatises by Prince, Walter, and Neat describe how this rhetorical vocabulary was readily applied to musical composition by way of pedagogical exercises, improvisation, and even musical vocabulary banks known as Figurenlehre, first begun by Burmeister. Prince, in fact, codified several thousand musical figurations in one of his treaties, treatises in order to train composers in the art of varying a melody, or as he defined it, an invention. The practice of invention appears prominently at the turn of that century, ranging from didactic, as in Prince's treatise, to fantastical, as in Neat's musical guide. In fact, Neat's work in the early 1700s defines the invention principle as a pattern developed over a given harmonic formula, while Forkel describes it as a composition through imitation of a musical idea. So imitation, now if you know these pieces, you're finding that everything I've mentioned so far is going to find root and synthesis in the inventions and symphonias. Now, C.P.E. Bach described his father's melodies as Quote, always varied, rich in invention, and resembling no other composer, end quote. <coughs> Although in that quote, he's making it a point to say, like, yeah, my dad's music doesn't really, isn't really relevant anymore. But. <laughs> well, who do we think of when we think of Bach? So there. Now, although this invention principle originated in rhetoric and musical text setting, its application to instrumental music was deeply ingrained in Bach's early training and later instruction. Kircher, in 1650, described the rhetorical invention technique as choosing a theme or subject whose material was to become the basis and foundation for a desired composition. If you know these inventions and symphonias, things will start to click in a manner of I've noticed that before. Mm -hmm. Well, so did these people, before the pieces were written. It's one of the amazing mm -hmm. facets of Baroque music is that Bach, even though we place him on a pedestal, was the summation of everything before him. Which is why when we play Bird or Melrolo, it sounds a little foreign sometimes, as audiences who perhaps don't listen to a lot of Baroque music will discover. To those of us who do, we go, so, but understanding the music before Bach takes a lot of time and patience. The composer, once having an invention technique in mind, could then decide key, rhythm, and meter for a desired affect. A fantasia technique might then develop, 
in which the composer or performer wrote or improvised a work based on, according to Kircher, a short mechanical contrapuntal pattern. That should sound familiar in some way. These rhetorical figures were both musically linguistic and keyboard centered, and because of their gesturally sound and keyboard idiomatic writing, they would produce the four tastes in composition that Bach desired. Now, so you wouldn't clutter a piece with excessive, unrelated rhetorical information, Matheson argued in 1739 for the use of only a few ideas, or lochi topici, was what he called them, at a time. We've heard that before. Concerning this singing manner of playing, Walter, who was also Bach's cousin, defined this cantabile as possessing a fine melody and a piece in which every part is capable of being sung. Now this should come as no surprise if you play anything by Bach, you can pretty much sing every line, even in a four-part chorale, which, well, our resident organist could um, tell you that those pieces are prominently still hymns because of the ease of which one can sing them, or not. Bach's, Bach treats the voice like an instrument sometimes, but he treats the instrument like a voice. Cantabile writing was largely reserved for music in which the individual obligato lines formed logical, singable phrases and were also individually singable and of equal interest. Now, according to David Ledbetter, this manner of writing was considered the essence of Baroque compositional technique. In my mind, as I was researching these, these pieces and thinking, okay, they are getting higher and higher in exemplars of what Baroque music can be because they fulfill all of the contemporary standards of the day. Each piece uses only a few motives, which become the basis for virtually all of that piece's thematic content. Each gesture is highly singable, and all gestures are idiomatic to the keyboard. Now I'd like to present several figurations and their appearances in select <coughs> inventions and symphonias. These figures can best be described as, according to Voltaire, consisting of several notes which are put together in different ways, having from their specific shape specific names. All of the definitions here can be found in Dietrich Bartel's Musica Poetica. Do whatever you can to get that book. It is a masterpiece of understanding the music of the day, ranging from the music of Martin Luther's time all the way to Beethoven. Even if, you know, largely dealing with Baroque music, it's just a fabulous book. At the keyboard, the shape of each musical gesture on the page translates to discrete groups of notes, which become patterns under the hand. And each pattern requires a specific physical gesture necessary to deliver the rhetorical meaning. And this is the work of Joel Spierstra, actually writing about um, the pedal clavichord in a book on, um, well, Bach and the clavichord. It's really quite good. So we have four categories, motivic, decorative, contrapuntal, and imitative. The first motivic is perhaps what I would consider the smallest unit. We start with the figure of Corta, which both Prince and Walter describe as consisting of three rapid notes in which one of which has a duration equal to that of the other two combined. This device is featured prominently in Invention 6 and Symphonias 8 and 12, oh, and Invention 5. And according to Bartel, it is frequently used to express agitation, or in these cases, joyful affections due to the inherent rhythm, uh, rhythmic drive in a series of corte. An execution of the corte involves grouping three notes in quick succession in this way such that the longer note is accented and held while the shorter notes are played and lightly. 
physically, the hand must propel the shorter notes to the longer. Now we can think. That da da dee, the hand has to move in such a way that the longer note is an arrival. Another small scale yet rhythmically prominent device is the incoitio imperfecta, or the imperfect beginning. Bartel's definition gives one the impression that you could improvise some figured bass perhaps if you want, and as a teaching technique to help a student appreciate the harmony that's being set up, these pieces actually supply a useful opportunity. Now, although they don't require continual, oops. although they do not require continual, there is an obligation of the performer as a continual player to be able to supply these notes, and this is the words of Christoph Bernhard. A considerable number of these pieces, as you can see, use a naked bass note to begin, but you can add harmony. Or it's symphony number one. I think it's a very useful teaching technique, personally. And um, even from my piano days, uh, my teachers would sometimes be improvising harmony on the piano next to me while I was just playing. And it, it does give one the impression of continual. Now, the passus durisculus, or harsh passage, is a voice rising or falling by half steps, according to a number of theorists. And it appears in various forms. This is a more, more joyful example. There's the figura corta at the end. Now, you might notice as we go through these that the devices start stacking up. You start to get more vocabulary developing. <laughs> Now, the more common chromatic descending pattern we might, just, we might recognize as a lament bass. It signals an affect of sorrow or pain, but it also touches on another rhetorical device, the pathopoeia, which you have here. The most Easily recognizable gesture is in, or example of this is in the Symphony 9. The lament bass pattern shows up in Bach and often has the greatest harmonic um, information among any. Baroque composers, among all Baroque composers. A sustained touch is going to likely bring out that device and the weight involved as the um, these much earlier definitions lead us to desire. Now related to this is the saltus durius which is a leap of a diminished interval. It's quite common in Bach, and one can hear it most audibly in the um, Symphonia 9. This tritone leap. What's kind of funny to me is, is I, was, I was working on these pieces for my uh, doctoral lecture recital, which you're hearing um, an abbreviated version of today. And I shouldn't say abbreviated. It's not dumbed down or anything like that. It's um, just for time's sake. Um, when I was playing Symphonia 9, I was using a very spicy mean tone temperament. And when I was practicing them, 
for these pieces. My son was sitting in his cradle next to the harpsichord and generally very calm, but any time I played Symphonia 9, he started crying. Oh. Oh. I think it was the temperament oh. of, of the harpsichord, not, not, not his yeah. temperament. <laughs> <That's right. laughs> He's been hearing harpsichord music in utero too, so... <laughs> now, in order to execute that kind of gesture, one might detach the first note a little bit and use a little more weight on the second note to bring emphasis to the leap and especially the arrival. The next category of gestures is decorative. And we begin with the transitus. Now these gestures are somewhat open-ended because they can occur as ornamentations of leaps or of material between structural pitches. They can decorate a sequence. They can do a lot of different things. Bartel describes the transitus as a dissonant or passing note between two consonant ones, either on the strong or weak beat. It's essentially, in, in this case, could be any run that fills out a harmony. Um, because there were so many myriad definitions and applications, they were to commonly be considered embellishments, and they were taken for granted by Bach's time as one of the more basic devices of composition. So, we go a little bit deeper to actual specific gestures. The groppo immediately comes to mind because of its longevity. It was extremely popular in Italian Baroque music. It is a circular type of motion and it gives one the impression of a ball rolling. Um, it can be inverted. Or So an articulation that brings out this gesture is probably going to give a little more weight to the first note, maybe the third note, but something that shows you what the principal note is, what the next principal note is, and so forth, if it's in a sequence, such as in Invention 8. Now also appearing in Symphonia 1 there is the Tirata according to an slightly earlier definition because when one thinks of the Tirata whose Latin definition is a spear one thinks of a very quick rapid gesture but the definition still lasted up into the 1730s and certainly later I'm sure a row of numerous notes of the same duration which either ascend or descend by step You heard it in the beginning of the toccata I played. These gestures would occupy the span of a fifth, a sixth, most commonly an octave. So a touch emphasizing the placement of the beat and the arrival is going to make that gesture really fly like it's... Um, Latin transliteration of a sphere would have us believe. The even more general diminutio is featured in nearly every invention in Symphonia, and most commonly when a longer note, such as a half note or whole note, is divided into numerous shorter ones, according to Meinrad Spies. Walter expands this definition to include decorations of both stepwise motions and leaps, and this gesture is most notable as a decoration of sequential motion, such as this invention. We have... It's just being decorated. A better example can be found in 
Sinfonia 6 because of its numerous sequences and the decorations surrounding them. <laughs> And what we get with all of these decorations You can hear the harmonic structure, but you also hear how it is decorated and ornamented. Now, the third category of these gestures are those of a contrapuntal nature, and because these pieces instruct the performer in counterpoint, I'm limiting our scope to just the more unusual gestures, or gestures that might not need a huge amount of explanation. In the symphonias, one finds the metabasis, or the transgressio, which occurs when one voice crosses over the other. It's known as the transgressio because it's an enormous irregularity in traditional counterpoint. If you've ever taken um, undergraduate theory classes, they yell at you if you do voice crossings. Well, the people who invented the rules did it all the time, so, you know. My <laughs> wife's a theorist and we gripe about this all the time. Um, in order to keep the two voices distinct, a harpsichordist needs to differentiate the articulation. Plain and simple. As a pianist, we bring out the voicing. As an organist, we might have a little more breath in one voice than another. Applies to harpsichord as well. Articulation is our best friend, really. Another contrapuntal device is the syncopatio, or ligatura, which occurs when a rhythmically shifted note stands against a consonance and a dissonance. And there's another, even more vivid definition. The notes are expressed and, ex and sung against the taktus, or strong beat, in such a manner as if to strike against or assail the measured beat. We know this as a suspension. Harpsichordists may linger slightly on the hell note to demonstrate to the listener that that note is indeed dissonant against a strong beat. This is the easiest example to show. But there, are, as you can see, there are many, many more examples. Now the final category of gesture is imitation. And these are more conceptual in nature because, well, frankly, the pieces are studies in imitation, but also because imitation has to do with the piece's structure at times. Now, the most readily apparent device that we know of is the fuga, or chase. In, it was, it's funny because it was initially regarded as an anomaly in rhetorical devices in music because it was considered bad taste to be repeating ideas in rhetoric, but as a compositional device, it caught on obviously very quickly because if you know anything about Renaissance music, imitation was considered pretty standard, especially in um, the counterpoint of Italy and Spain at this time. Then gradually it caught on in rhetoric and the two fused together. It's quite brilliant. Baroque definitions abound, but I think this one of, by Nuscius really um, gets the point across. Frequent successive repetitions of the same theme in diverse voices, which chase each other. This gesture might be the most common in all 30 pieces because each piece has its own primary subject that is constantly being imitated. Equally common is the mimesis, not to be confused with mimosis, um, or imitatio. It's an approximate rather than strict imitation of a subject at different places. It differs in that from the fuga because material within a section is 
repeated rather than throughout the piece's entirety. I think a great example is this sequence that unfolds here. Different idea, it's just inverted. And then, also inverted. And then the first idea is an inversion of what we hear at the very beginning, as I'm sure all of you know this piece. Which right away is inverted. We also have an example of this in Symphonia 12. If you look at the third measure of this excerpt. By the way, that figura corta. We've heard this before. Now, that same passage in Invention 1 features another device, hypalage, or hypalaga, if you speak Greek, which unfortunately I do not. Um, the fuga introduces an inverted order of the intervals, which I just demonstrated to you. This is why Invention 1 is so brilliant. It has virtually everything you could ask for in a contrapuntal study, and that's why we keep teaching it. It was my first invention. Related to this is the repercussio, which might be defined from this as a tonal answer. Numerous examples can be found in the 30 pieces. Um, the definition of a real answer versus a tonal answer in a fugue is, I'm sure we all know, but just in case um, we need reminder, is that a real answer is a note interval for interval repetition of a fugue subject in a different voice, maybe with a different starting pitch, but a tonal answer alters the intervals a little bit so that harmonically the subject and counter subject of the fugue can function. That's not Bach, by the way, that is the, that is Walter's own of example, but I think the point is pretty clear. Lastly, the somewhat complex device of Peronomasia appears in several symphonias, literally meaning, quote, additional name in Greek. This gesture resembles a close repetition of material for emphasis. Um, it doesn't just repeat a passage, but it edits it some way. Um, <laughs> Peronomasia in Greek also means a love of puns, which um, is a part of my, um, it's part of what I do for it, my own entertainment and for the punish, punishment of those around me. <laughs> in this case, things are just flipped. <laughs> again. Symphonia, this device appears in um, Symphonia 12. Um, one great way to look at this is invertible counterpoint, which Bach was such a master of, and I mean not just Bach, of course, you can find examples in Handel and Telemann and most of the great German Baroque composers and beyond, of course. This is a superb example if you look at the third measure of this excerpt right in the middle, you will discover that the voices just two measures later are all flipped around, but the notes are essentially the same.
Now, I believe your handouts contain several examples of every device at work, but because we are going to run out of time, I, I'll skip to just a few prominent ones. But I think I'll just conclude the talking portion of this with the following. That identifying numerous gestures in a single piece heightens awareness of expressive detail and performance. And an informed interpretation of each rhetorical musical gesture impacts performance decisions as you prepare the piece or pieces. Numerous devices inflect Influence, sorry, numerous devices influence the affect of each piece, such as meter or other rhythmic devices or key or I don't know the temperament you're using. There are, there are many things, but I wanted to stick to something we can just see in the score and is a little bit less up for um, debate. In the end, all rhetoric yields to the taste of the performer. And I think through all of this information, we can learn a thing or two about how to approach pieces we've um, known since we were children and can still mine for gold. So, a couple examples of where you might find, find these pieces. Um, these, these rhetorical devices are in, in the handouts. Um, you can go home and explore them if you would like. You can play them. You can write to me later and tell me I'm completely wrong if you so desire. That's quite all right, too. That's why historical performance is not a dead end. We can mine these pieces for the rest of our lives and still not even come close to scratching the surface. Um, that's it for me. But if you would like to talk about things, um, ask some questions, challenge me on points, that's fine too. Okay. So you uh, mentioned earlier that each gesture has a kind of an unexpected aspect, but then on the way that you Yes. Um, it's in, well, <laughs> scratching the surface here, but um, for instance, the Korta, which has this idea behind it of um, agitation or joy, I have to look at the exact quote um, where I found that, but yes, a lot of these would be, um, they were explained in terms of, of greater affect than might express. And the, this one is such a, um, a go-to just because it's, you know, the lament based. For instance. Sorry. Um, but there are, there are others too. Um, uh, Actually, the, <laughs> they're, they're in the um, handout too. I, I wish we had time to go through every single one of these, but if you look at Invention 8, uh, the, the examples in the handout, by the way, are I've organized by increasing complexity. Um, the Salto Semplice, for instance, um, anything with... Um, some kind of leap to it uh, might be influenced by the time signature or the key, but a lot of leaps and activity with running notes might signify um, something more joyful, something more um, fast-paced even. Um, something like Prince's book will lead one to you know, find find actual affective instruction. If if, if that helps. It it really is. It 
you know, these, these devices wouldn't necessarily say, okay, every piece of this device is going to be this way, but that's where contextual evidence such as a time signature or uh, where that gesture is placed within a strong and weak beat or key or once in a while you'll find a temple marking in Bach, um, Bach keyboard music, but you know, these things aren't limited to just German music. You can find them in Corelli, which has loads of temple markings. Um, so context can help, treatises can help too. If, and I hope that helped. Yes, sir. I've been thinking a lot lately about memorization because I'm terrible at it. <laughs> and you know, because, because most of us rely on muscle memory and things like mm -hmm. that. But I, it's gotten me thinking because I was thinking along this line this morning that being able to talk about in your own mind a piece with this language mm -hmm. as a tool for understanding, for memorization, mm -hmm. for if, if you know, but you, you know, you just draw a blank, which is my usual thing. I just draw a blank, but I have a short passage I have to memorize because of the page turn, mm -hmm. and I'm beginning to. It was I was beginning to think along these lines yesterday. Um, you know, if I can tell myself it's got this pattern and it's followed by that pattern and it's followed by that pattern mm -hmm. and it goes up or it goes down, if that is a useful tool in that Sure. Yeah, yeah I, you know, it's funny, I, I was working on um, these pieces while learning Continuo for a couple of Bach cantatas I was um, working on uh, for some concerts and also working on the toccata that I played today, all while being a very new parent. <laughs> so um, my brain was a sieve at that point, but I, 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 to go along with this, I, I personally found that just by looking at gestures and really starting to understand how the tapestry of Bach's music is woven together, I learned the pieces a lot faster than other, I otherwise would have, which was a very good thing because um, you know, just when time is not on your side, just having some kind of aural, muscle, mental memory of a piece can help enormously. Um, this actually ties in with Bach's own pedagogy because um, when he would get a student, and we know this from uh, reports of his students um, who talked to Forkel and talked to other people who jotted it all down, um, he would work with them on continual playing and counterpoint simultaneously, like we should be doing in general. Um, and then he would move on to just mechanical exercises, usually at the clavichord. And after months of torturing them, they finally said, we can't take it, we have to learn actual pieces. These were what he assigned. And he moved on from two part to three parts dance movements to well tempered clavier. Um, but having Bach's own language in their hands and in their minds and in their ears was, was designed to speed up that process as well. It's amazing because we use the same progression of pieces even now, um, 300 years later. It, it just works. Um, it's also worth pointing out that he was training not just good keyboard players, but he was training competitive organists. Uh, people who were going to go um, duke it out for a municipal or a clerical position, they had to be able to improvise. I mean, you know, Bach's legendary status as an improviser was not uncommon. He just was J.S. Bach, so he gets that kind of attention, but they, they would certainly have these patterns in the hand. And, I mean, Orgel Bookline has all of this. Well, Tepper Clavier has all of this. Um, it was a common musical language, so I, uh, whether by doing things by memory or by improvising, I mean, it, was, it was in their hands. And it's in ours too. It's just a little bit farther removed, but it's still. Um, other things. I think that you mentioned the organ, organ loop line is a, a great place to really look at things like Corta uh, because then you have the text of the chorale yes. which sets the affect uh, and 
When I was in college, we went to a weekend where Anton Heiler, the organist, played through the Orgo Buchlein and talked about it. And he talked about a lot of these things, that rhythm, that all of these things. And here we could see the text of the chorale. We could hear how he was creating the affect that would match and be the musical uh, message that was also conveyed in the words mm -hmm. um, through all these means. And so I think that's another rich place to mine for the structures and the motifs and the techniques uh, as it's it's much easier to see when you have the chorale text and the and the melodies which are known to people. Yes. yes. I mean, when yes. he would improvise on a chorale, once he started uh, a familiar chorale, everybody in the audience knew what he, what, you know, what he was referring to because uh -huh. they sang those, and so it was. Uh, it became a sign that he was uh, working with. In, in communicating, again, sort of theological rhetoric, uh, theological statements mm -hmm. through music. That has a lot to do with um, what I was um, describing as uh, the Lutheran concept of maybe a sermon through sound. Um, the Lutheran theology of the 16th century and, and going forward really believed that music was almost on par with the preaching of the Bible. Uh, which was certainly part of Luther's approach um, to Christianity. And the practice of ecclesiastical music in that day was to aid the presentation of scripture through music. And the result was supposed to be a congregation that was much more in tune to the things of God. Um, one could go on and on about that, and I wish I were more qualified to talk about it, but... Well, we know that uh, like the, some of the two-part cantatas, I believe, were, were in the liturgical service before and after the sermon. So, mm. you know, if, you, uh, if he was working with the gospel for the day, and the minister was preaching the gospel of the day, and here is a cantata that bookends the sermon. I, I, I think I'm not making that up. But I mean, that's, that was again the prominence that was given to music in mm -hmm. in, in Lutheran liturgy. Mm -hmm. That's good for us to remember. Um, context in music accounts for a lot, and the more we can pay attention to that. I mean, no piece, no piece is ever written in isolation. There's always the music of the day, the politics of the day, which, you know, sometimes there, there, are, there are texts in Bach's to, um, cantatas that might make us think, like, eh, maybe we don't want to program this piece. Um, some anti-Semitism, for instance. But Luther was notoriously anti-Semitic, so, you know, having that understanding, we think, like, okay, so it... It wasn't that Bach was like a deliberate racist, it was just a contextual notion, cultural notion of the day that we have to contend with. But, you know, there are so many, so many pieces we have to approach with that kind of a grain of salt. Um, it's nigh on five, so we should probably wrap up. Thank you. Thank you. Andrew. Thank you, sir. Is there much of this terminology and language a hundred years earlier? Yeah. 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 Yeah.